So since we're commemorating the D-Day landings in Operation Overlord, I thought I would do a couple of videos on the Overlord communications. I'm going to go into an area that isn't well known, and that is the wideband communications that linked the beaches over in Normandy back to Britain. Now, you guys of course are more familiar with the small radio sets that, that are used, or maybe the equipment used in the armor, or shipboard equipment, airborne equipment, and so on. But I want to get into the wideband equipment that was capable of sending multiple radio teletype, uh, radio telegraphy, facsimile, that is uh, pho photography across the channel, and multiple voice channels. This equipment was state-of-the-art. Uh, it operated on, in the VHF spectrum, and it was using wideband FM techniques as well as sophisticated telephony techniques known as carrier and repeater. Now carrier and repeater, uh, basically a telephone system that allows you to put multiple voice channels on one transmission line, was explored of course by AT&T and Western Electric in the 1930s. This was adopted by the military kind of uh, in the middle of World War II, they decided they needed to have this technology. So we're going to get into this fairly deep technology in two videos and see how you can transmit multiple visual and radio teletype signals uh, down an RF circuit. So get ready for this one. By the way, my source is a signal core material, and I'll, I'll leave the references to that signal core material. Um, there's going to be a shootout that you're going to find out about between British and American radio sets, because uh, what was learned in North Africa, they knew that, uh, based on Italy, that the radio equipment was going to have to change on the beaches and uh, in country. Once you got on continent, the whole ball game changes. So the Signal Corps actually did a shootout pitting various types of radio systems from the British and American and Australian side, Canadian equipment, to see would AM and CW suffice or did we need to go to FM? So that's going to be something that uh, we're going to have here. We call it a radio shootout. So stand by. We're getting into D-Day communications but high-tech D-Day communications. So what is the bandwidth of a pair of wires? Theoretically, a transmission line is capable of transmitting frequencies ranging from zero to infinity. But for practical considerations, an open wire transmission line is capable of efficiently transmitting frequencies probably from zero to about 150,000 cycles. So. Our old twisted pair can handle 0 to 150 kilohertz of signal without appreciable attenuation, probably up to about a mile. And uh, if we consider that our voice frequency is only between a couple hundred and maybe 3,000 hertz, or a range of less than 3,000 cycles, only a very small portion of the potential frequency range capabilities of that line is utilized in a single voice conversation. So in effect the entire frequency range from 2800 to 150 kilohertz is wasted. Now we don't have to waste that and I know that you know the EE8 field telephone setups with the switchboards were used throughout World War II in tactical situations but we don't need to waste all of that capability of that transmission line. Western Electric developed a system that would allow several channels to be stacked onto the same pair of wires by translating or shifting each audio source to a higher center carrier frequency. This is called frequency division multiplex. This can easily be done with oscillators and balanced modulators. And if you follow each balanced modulator with a bandpass filter, you send only one sideband 
down the line at a time and suddenly you have the original baseband audio and three or more carrier based sidebands that you have stacked on your single transmission line. You can demodulate any of these by reinserting an appropriate center carrier frequency at the other end. Pretty clever. The initial military version of the CF1 and CF2 could do four channels on each pair of wires. A special cable called Spiral 4 was developed that allowed four carrier signals to ride on each wire. So now we're up to 16 voice or radio teletype channels all down one cable. This is a far improvement over the simple EE8 twisted pair field phone and a switchboard. The price for all of this technology was heavy, heavy equipment, complex equipment. So the idea was initially rejected by the Signal Corps in the 30s. But by the middle of World War II, they definitely knew they needed this ruggedized terminal equipment. And they needed repeaters to be able to extend that cable. And uh, this meant some pretty high technology. This uh, system would actually allow full duplex operation out beyond 100 miles with this new cable. The early rubber Spiral 4 WF8-G cable would work over 5 miles without a repeater, and it was reeled in quarter mile lengths. It used a new sexless universal plug system that definitely was state of the art at the time. This system would be very useful as it allowed command center liaison work in a pure wireline approach. For instance, the command center could be connected to a forward base, or it could be connected to a ship off the beach with this Spiral 4 cable and you'd instantly have 16 channels. 16 channels of voice, radio teletype, or even facsimile. Each quarter mile length of Spiral 4 had a set of loading coils that were uh, inserted in the connectors themselves. These loading coils flatten the response of the cable when you get out to the longer lengths. This loading is typically called line treatment in telephone terms. Miniature toroids were installed inside each connector. I told you this was pretty high tech for 1944. Let's talk about the carrier systems that were available for D-Day. First of all, we had the CF1 voice system the CF2 telegraphy terminal, and the CF3 full duplex repeater. Let me go through a typical forward channel carrier system first using the CF1. There would be an identical reverse channel, of course. This first channel is at conventional baseband, and it occupies the voice frequencies below 3000 Hz. The second channel, which is the first carrier channel, is a single sideband signal generated by a somewhat higher local oscillator of 6 kilohertz. As long as a suitable guard band is kept between all of these channels and you have decent filtering, there is no crosstalk and the signals will all ride nicely down one transmission line in the cable. On the other end, each frequency is demodulated by inserting the same frequency carrier at that end and then producing your audio by running it through a low pass filter. Now I'm doing it with the lower sidebands, but you could just as well do it with the upper sidebands. There's four channels here. One is baseband and three RF channels. These are stacked on top of each other, occupying approximately 12,000 hertz. Now this represents using one wire in the spiral four cable. Since we have four wires, we can uh, have four times the capability in the forward going direction. There's no crosstalk as long as we're controlling these frequencies closely. So let's uh, move over to the telegraphy channel. And this is typically used for teletype channels, not for hand telegraphy. The CF2 is capable of four full duplex 60 word per minute teletype channels. Now each one of these is at a lower frequency as you can see that fits well inside a voice channel. So you can use the CF1 system 
one of the CF1 system channels to do four telegraphy channels. So if we add this all together, we can get up to 16 60 word per minute teletype channels by using the CF1 in conjunction with the CF2. Now I do know that during D-Day they were using these for facsimile as well. And I'm going to get into the actual cross-channel link loaded throughput and performance in part two. You might already know about the SCR 508. Uh, the 508 system was the wideband FM system that was put into the armor, specifically Sherman tanks, half tracks, and other armor that would be on the beach for D Day. This was new equipment, so this wideband FM equipment, SCR 508, would be a new thing. Now, wideband FM, what is wideband FM? Basically, you have a modulation associated with the human voice. Typically, you need between 300 hertz and 2600 hertz for a, a voice channel. And uh, we know that uh, a typical uh, modulated voice channel takes up around 7 or 8 kilohertz. So with guard bands, maybe you want to have a 8 or a 10 kilohertz channel before you start to put another transmission channel in. So if you divide up the uh, 2 to 8 megahertz spectrum into 10 kilohertz channels, it's pretty apparent how many channels you can support. So what would be a way of using wideband FM? Now we know that wideband FM has advantages when you do just the opposite. In other words, you take that voice band and you make the carrier much, much wider. So now the carrier frequency is much, much wider than the actual modulation source. That is really the definition of spread spectrum. Spread spectrum means that your carrier modulation is much wider or much faster than your actual modulating energy. So uh, the nature of wideband FM used in this way is it's very difficult to jam. Certainly a spot jammer would not be effective. A swept jammer would not be effective. And uh, they knew that the Germans probably did not have the facilities to be able to jam the new tanks and half tracks using this wideband FM method to replace the older AM and CW. So that's one way that FM was used during D-Day. It was used in the armor. But solving that problem of getting the communications from the battlefront on the beaches back to the commanders that were over in England, that problem had to be solved in a way that uh, was pretty much jam-proof and they had to be able to transmit many circuits. So this is uh, kind of something that hasn't been taught too much and how you can take multiple voice channels and multiple telegraphy and teletype signals, put them on a wideband FM carrier and use them to bridge the gap from the beach across the channel back to Britain. So the extremely sensitive method of transmission was called the ANTRAC. The ANTRC 1 through 4 had been developed. The TRCs were basically wideband FM transmitters and receivers that could be configured as repeaters. And these systems would allow several audio, telegraph, and radio teletype signals to simultaneously ride on an, a wideband FM carrier. The TRC equipment, the Antrax, allow multiple audio, telegraphy, and radio telephone signals to all be multiplexed onto a single wideband FM carrier. It's very easy to repeat the signal by using two wideband FM channels. One can be used for the reception and one can be used for the retransmission. 
So in order to bridge the channel, we would need a ship equipped with the transmission facilities as well as the telephone switchboard facilities, and we need a center repeater station that can rebroadcast the signal back to the island. So it's going to take at least three types of equipment, transmission equipment, repeater equipment, and reception equipment. And if you want full duplex operation, which is also available with this equipment, you double up everything and you can have two-way communications, both teletype, telegraphy, and audio channels. So this was all done on VHF channels, what today we would recognize as the FM band, the band specifically between 60 and 100 megahertz. So now I think we have a foundation on the radio frequency carrier based telephony and the promised advantages of wideband FM radio comms. In the follow-up video, part two, I'm going to do a conventional radio review. What did they carry to the beach on D-Day? And how successful was this gear uh, in day one? How did it compare to the plan? I'm also going to introduce a sensitive radio shootout. What's a radio shootout? Well, that's basically where you take all of the radios that you have in service and you pit them against each other to see which radio works the best. And uh, this shootout was held in the Allegheny Mountains of Pennsylvania and involved British and American equipment. And there was an introduction of uh, this new uh, Armstrong and Motorola FM gear into the mix. Uh, you're going to really enjoy this. Uh, the FM gear, by the way, was first introduced in 1941 into armor, uh, primarily the uh, Stuart and Sherman tanks to begin with. And uh, this replaced the AM and CW gear that was used in armor at the time. Uh, this FM gear did see some action in North Africa and in Italy. Uh, and an FM backpack, the SCR 300, uh, was also introduced during the Italian campaign. So FM was out there, but it really didn't get its real test until D-Day. Also, I'll go through the innovation of using fax machines on the wideband network. And uh, this allowed photo reconnaissance data to be sent directly from the processing and identification facility after the aircraft film was uh, developed right to the beachhead to target enemy gun emplacements and this could all happen in mere hours using our wideband network. Finally, I'll cover that wideband network itself, the actual installed system on each side of the channel that formed the network, and its performance against conventional radio and submarine cables.